It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. Uh, we have two students today, as I uh, mentioned in the introductions, who organized this weekend's rally against the repeal of the updated uh, sex health, sexual health uh, and education curriculum. And I wanted to commend them for showing the incredible leadership that they showed on the weekend. Uh, last week, the education minister said that students need to learn about consent, cyberbullying, and gender identity and appreciation. A few hours later, she backpedaled and left students, teachers, and school boards more confused than ever. Will the Premier confirm that all information about consent, cyberbullying, and gender identity from the updated health curriculum will be taught in Ontario's classrooms this September? Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. As I've said day and day after day, I said it very clearly. We're going to consult, Mr. Speaker, with the people of Ontario. There's 14 million people in Ontario, and less than 0.001% of the public school system, the separate school system, was consulted. That's not consulting people. When you have 1,600 people online, by the way, the curriculum was already done. And then they decided to go out and get 1,600 people and get their opinion. Mm -hmm. I know the Leader of the Opposition doesn't believe in consulting with parents. Yeah. We believe in consulting with parents. And once we do Response. the largest consultation in the history of Ontario, then we'll be able to answer your question. Here, thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Speaker, yesterday the Deputy Premier said, and I quote, issues related to self-identity and self-expression will be included in the curriculum this fall. Will the Premier confirm that all information about sexual orientation, gender identity, LGBTQ families from the updated health curriculum will be taught in Ontario's schools this coming September? Premier. Mr. Speaker, that's not a to us to decide up in, in this chamber. It's up, it's up to the people. It's up, I know you don't believe in consulting with the people. It's up to the people of this great province to give us the direction to make that decision. I listen to the people, for the people. We ran a campaign for the people. It's not for the government or for the opposition, yeah. or for the special interest groups. Yeah. It's for the people. Here, here. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, it looks like it's just for the Premier's favoured spe favorite special interest group, Speaker. That's the problem. It's not for the safety of our kids. It's for the Premier's favorite special interest group. Look, the Premier's backroom deal to scrap the updated health curriculum is causing nothing but confusion for students and for school boards and for teachers, and we all know why. The Premier made that backroom deal with social conservatives to help him get elected, and now he's repaying his political debt to those radical activists, doing it at the expense of Ontario students and in apparent opposition to his deputy premier and education minister. Why is the premier putting his own political interests first and putting the safety of our kids in jeopardy? Premier. Mr. Speaker, Leader of the Opposition, I have the greatest deputy premier I could ever ask for. Yeah. We, we ran, again, on a message for the people. And when the people speak, we listen. We don't believe in the big government. We don't believe in the nanny state. We don't believe in politicians dictating to the people. We believe in empowering the people and let them make the decision. Thank you. Please take your seat. Restart the clock. Next question. Leader Thank, you. Thank you very much, Speaker. My next question is uh, again for the Premier. 
The Premier's decisions are being driven by backroom insiders, not by what's best for all Ontarians. The Premier said his backroom deal with Hydro One would cost zero, absolutely zero, but now we know that Mayo Schmidt will walk out the door with at least $9 million. And if Hydro One's deal with Avista falls through, Hydro One ratepayers could be on the hook uh, to pay over $100 million to a dirty, coal-burning American power plant. When will the Premier release the full details and full costs of his backroom deal with Hydro One? Premier. Mr. Speaker, through you, we ran on getting rid of the CEO of Hydro One. We ran on getting rid of the entire board. Yep. We did exactly what we promised. Yeah. Promises made, promises kept. We also ran on a promise that we're going to reduce hydro rates by 12 percent, and that is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to put money back into the people's pocket instead of the government's pocket. We're going to help small businesses. We're going to help families that are struggling to put food on the table when they have a choice between paying the highest hydro rates in North America or putting food on their table. Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what we won't do is lay 7,000 people off. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members take their seats. We start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I guess the pledge not to waste the precious public dollars has gone by the wayside. Nine million plus 103 million plus who knows how many billions with cap and trade cancellation is going to cost the people of Ontario a hell of a lot of wasted money for his political purposes, Speaker. But look, the people of Ontario deserve to know the full cost of the Premier's backroom deal at Hydro One. But the Premier has refused to come clean on that deal, Speaker, and that's why New Democrats were trying to bring forward an amendment to Bill 2 to require Hydro One to publish the full details of payments made to the departing CEO and the board of directors, but the government has decided instead to ram the bill through with little debate, no committee hearing, no chance for the people to have a say. Why is the Premier shutting down an opportunity for the people of Ontario to have their say on this bill? Premier. Mr. Speaker, when we talk about hydro, my friend across the aisle, leader of the opposition, had her members go out during the election and lobby for the highest hydro rates in North yep. America, the largest Absolutely. carbon tax, Absolutely. the largest carbon tax, of 35 cents. The, the largest Ooh, carbon tax, yep. more expensive yeah. than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, they did. They did. They did. Order. I have to be able to hear the Premier. Wow. Premier. <laughs> You had one of your candidates bragging we should have the highest carbon tax in North America Absolutely. in the entire world. We're taking a different approach. We're, we're actually going to reduce gas prices by 10 cents a liter, making people more competitive, businesses more competitive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Well, what wasn't true during the, collect, uh, the election campaign is still not true today, Speaker. But look, what a, what a start. You know, what a start for this For the People Premier, the very first piece of legislation to be tabled in this legislature, and he's shutting out the people in terms of the committee hearings and opportunity for public debate and scrutiny of his first piece of legislation. That's not very transparent, Speaker. That's not gathering the voices of the people. It's shutting out the voices of the people. He needs to tell us what the full costs are, Speaker, what the payment to pay Mayo Schmidt uh, and the Board of Directors is going to cost. He needs to tell the government how he's going to protect Ontarians from $103 million in charges and fines if the Avista deal falls, falls through. And he has to come clean about any further costs Fine. as a result of this backroom deal. Will the Premier release the full cost, Speaker? Yeah, Premier. 
Mr. Speaker, Leader of the Opposition, I'll tell you what transparency is. Transparency is when you make promises during the election, you keep your promises. Yeah. That's what's transparency. Stop the clock. Members, please take your seat. Restart the clock. As, as we promised, as we promised, and we delivered on our promise, the CEO of Hydro One had a zero severance. There you go. Absolutely there you go. zero. You got your answer. Zero. We promised we're going to get rid of the cap and trade and carbon tax, the worst tax any, anyone could put on the backs of the taxpayers and businesses, and we're doing that. It's done. It's gone. We're putting money back into the people's pocket instead of the government's. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition, I appreciate your question. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. Today, the Financial Accountability Officer tabled his annual report. He specifically highlighted two of his office's most important reports, the real cost of selling off Hydro One and the real cost of the Liberal Hydro Plan, which is now the Ford Hydro Plan. <laughs> the FAO's nonpartisan expert report showed that privatizing Hydro One increases the deficit by billions. Privatization of Hydro One is a waste. It was a bad Liberal plan, and now it's a bad Ford plan. It's a deal that helps backroom insiders and big banks and hurts people. It's not a plan for the people, it's a plan for the rich. How can the Premier justify Hydro One privatization that adds billions to the deficit? Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank the member from the New Deficit Party, or New Democratic Party, for his question, Mr. Speaker. For 28, for 28 days, the most important standing committee that could ever be convened met. And on June 7th, they made their decision, Mr. Speaker. They supported this leader and our government to reduce their hydro rates by 12 percent. And in the past couple of weeks, we have moved quickly to renew the leadership for Hydro One, to get rid of projects that communities didn't—not only did they not need them, but they didn't want them, Mr. Speaker. We're on track to reduce those uh, hydro rates. Promises, plural, made. Promises kept, plural. Thank you. Stop the clock. Please sit down. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Premier. The FAO also highlighted the report in the Liberal the Lib also highlighted the report, the, the Hydro Liberal Plan. Last week the energy minister said he wasn't that familiar with the Liberal Plan. The only thing is the Liberal Plan is now the Conservative Plan. The FAO report shows that the Ford Hydro Plan will cost Ontario more than $45 billion. Wow. The FAO's nonpartisan expert report shows that bills will increase permanently and people will soon see annual increases of nearly 7 percent. The Premier says he's for the people, so why is his plan increasing their hydro bills by billions? Yeah. Once again, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, I'll just turn to my colleagues and ask for forgiveness that I don't pay attention to Liberal energy policy. No. Liberal energy policy that the NDP supported time in and time again, Mr. Speaker, that saw their hydro rates either go up or be subsidized for the next generation, which would be my little girls, Abigail May and Papa Kate, Mr. Speaker. We don't stand for that on this side of the House. We're saving taxpayers $790 million in today's dollars, Mr. Speaker, right. by, contract, by uh, terminating contracts that Ontarians don't want and don't need, Mr. Right. Speaker. We're renewing the leadership for Hydro One, and we're running, meeting our commitment to reduce hydro sure. rates for all rate payers. Members, take your seat. Restart the clock. Next question. Member for Mississauga Mountain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I rise for the first time in the House, I'd like to congratulate you on your election and like to say what you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you so much. You. And I'd like to congratulate the rest of my 122 MPPs on their election as well. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. First, I would like to congratulate the Minister for being tasked for this very important responsibility. Question. I know that Minister will serve his constituents and the people of Ontario with honesty and integrity. With the recent brazen and indiscriminate act of violence seen in the city of Toronto, I'm proud to know that our government for the people will ensure that our police and the first responders will have the resources question. and the tools required to perform their job safely and effectively. Mr. Speaker, our first responders perform their duty selflessly with incredible professionalism and they deserve to have the proper resources to perform their duties. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to our minister is, could the minister please explain to the members of this legislature all the ministries of that Minister. Minister, response. Minister of Community Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, firstly, I'd like to congratulate the honourable member from Mississauga, Malton, on his recent election as an MPP. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our thoughts uh, are with the victims and their families that experienced this senseless violence. I want to also thank the first responders who acted so quickly to help the victims bring the acts, this incident to an end. Public safety is our primary concern, and we're committed to examining current community funding programs and their effectiveness in reducing gun violence and gang-related activity in Ontario. This government has remained clear on the issue of gun violence and organized crime in Ontario. We will remain committed to providing our frontline officers with the tools and resources they require to perform the, their duties. We are going to get resources to our police services, Mr. Speaker. It's, it means boots on the ground. It means more resources on the front line so they can do their job. That's what we committed to in the last election. More tools, more resources, Response. more supports. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to Minister. Minister, over the past 15 years, we have repeatedly seen our police being unable to acquire the proper tools and resources they need to keep Ontario communities safe. This has placed our frontline officers at risk, which is simply unacceptable. Under the previous government, Mr. Speaker, our first responders were denied the ability to perform their job safely and effectively. <coughs> With the rise in gun violence in our streets, our first responders deserve better and deserve to perform their job safely. Mr. Speaker, with the rise in gun violence in our street, can the minister please explain how this ministry will help keep Ontario's communities safe? Minister. Thank you once again for that question. Mr. Speaker, gun violence destroys lives and is a menace to our communities. It has no place in Ontario's, and these attacks need to stop. The Premier had directed my ministry to work across government lines and with key stakeholders, including police, municipalities, and community organizations. We'll also want to work with the federal government to ensure their sentencing is tougher for people who have committed violent acts, and that the bail system is keeping our communities safe. The status quo is failing, Mr. Speaker, so I will remain committed to working with all members of this House and everyone in this province to find solutions that will keep our communities safe and protect Ontarians from being the victims of senseless violence. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Earlier this month, educators, elders, and knowledge keepers, including survivors of residential schools, were to, to travel to Toronto to participate in the curriculum writing session for the Truth and Reconciliation curriculum, one of the recommendations of the TRC Commission. This was cancelled on the Friday before people were set to travel, and in fact, some already had travelled into the city. Ministry staff have said that the move was taken in order to meet the directive by this government to find savings across the public service. Speaker, will the Premier tell us when the Truth and Reconciliation curriculum writing will resume? of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and we look forward to the opportunity for these young people, young Indigenous people, to have access to these uh, important uh, developments in the curriculum and for them to be a part of it. And we intend to see those meetings go on move, moving forward, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we were uh, put this on pause to be a little cost conscious about how, uh, how, how uh, we intend to proceed with this, but we'll uh, move forward with this in, in, in short order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the minister has said that the curriculum 
was postponed, not paused, as he said, not cancelled, and would resume. Summer was the ideal time for this curriculum writing to take place. In the fall, educators will have to be replaced in their classrooms by substitute teachers. This curriculum was to involve language and cultural learning as early as kindergarten, which is vitally important to preserving and passing on things like languages. Will the Premier tell educators, elders and students when the Truth and Reconciliation curriculum writing will, will resume? Paused is not good enough. That's right. <laughs> One of the most important things that we can do, Mr. Speaker, is to honour the principles of truth and reconciliation and ensure, as I think all colleagues from both sides could say and share, that there wasn't enough of that in our own curriculums growing up as children in our public and, and uh, school education system. We intend to remain committed to this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, and we'll have more to say about that in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. I represent many small communities that have felt neglected in the last 15 years. During the election, Premier Doug Ford and our Ontario PC team campaigned on the promise to make life easier for families, <coughs> businesses, seniors, students, and to send a message that Ontario is open for business. A key part of that promise is providing modern, reliable infrastructure to communities in every corner of this province. That includes expanding broadband access. Can the minister tell this House about how his ministry will be supporting our government's mandate to deliver relief for the people of rural Ontario? Well, thank you very much, and it's an honour uh, to rise uh, during question period for the first time as Minister of Infrastructure. I want to begin, uh, like many others have, uh, by thanking the people of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex for returning me uh, back to Queen's Park and to thank my wife, uh, Kate, and daughter Annie for all their uh, support. Um, also, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, thank the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell for this very uh, tough but fair uh, question uh, this morning. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, providing modern, reliable infrastructure to both our biggest cities and small towns is critical if we want to make Ontario open for business again. Access to broadband internet is a key part of supporting economic growth in all of our communities and is a uh, important uh, focus of the uh, Doug Ford government. I'm excited to work with our municipal partners, the Ministry of Agriculture Spots. and Rural Affairs, and the private sector to deliver on the expansion of this vital infrastructure. Okay. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. Thank you, minister. I'm pleased to hear that the Ministry of Infrastructure is committed to supporting our government's resounding mandate. The expansion of broadband is an important part of allowing our local communities to continue to grow and supporting the people who want to build their careers and raise their families in rural Ontario. I know there's a hodgepodge of programs and partnerships already underway between the different levels of government and the private sector to expand access to broadband and cellular services. Can the minister tell us more about the role that our government will be playing in modernizing this critical infrastructure? Minister. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I understand, as do my colleagues on this side of the House, uh, the value of reliable, high-speed internet uh, to our communities right across the province. It is not just a matter of convenience or supporting business growth. Broadband access can also improve uh, access and create cost savings in health care, transportation and the delivery of community services. In a few weeks, Mr. Speaker, I will be sitting down with hundreds of municipal representatives at AMO in Ottawa to discuss their priorities and how we can work with our municipal partners to deliver the modern, reliable infrastructure that families and businesses rely on. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for Hamilton West Lancaster Dundas. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Scrapping the cap and trade program does more harm than good. Case in point is my riding of Hamilton West and Castor Dundas. The latest victim of these conservative cuts, Mohawk College, has now fallen victim to these cuts, and they have had the $2 million promised clawed back. $2 million that was promised to open the new Centre for Climate Change Management. 
This centre was the first of its kind in Ontario, and it would have helped fast-track our region to a low-carbon economy. So now this innovative centre is scrambling to ensure that we can keep it alive. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask, how many more green initiatives will end up on the Conservative chopping block while it dismantles cap and trade. Premier, Minister of Environment. Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, through you thanking the member for her question. Our government was elected on a promise <coughs> that puts people first and makes life more affordable for Ontarians. As I've said before in this, in this House, we do understand the importance of tackling climate change, but we disagree fundamentally with the solution of a carbon tax or a cap-and-trade program. The programs that the members speak of were programs that were being funded by that regressive, unfair tax. And this government has been clear. It will cancel cap-and-trade, it will not support a carbon tax, and it cannot support the programs that were supported by that regressive tax. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, cancelling the cap and trade only hurts Ontario business, with small business suffering the most. And as we know, small business is the backbone of Ontario's economy. The federal government's Greenhouse Pollution Pricing Act will apply to businesses located across the province that don't have a cap and trade program. This means that the price of pollution ultimately falls on the rest of Ontario residents, those that are already struggling to make ends meet. So why is this Premier ignoring the financial burdens that come along with scrapping the cap and trade? And will the Conservative Premier be honest and tell us where this axe is going to fall next? Mr. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. This government has been very clear from the very beginning about our position on cap and trade. It is, it is a little bit rich to think that, that a tax is about how we are going to make business competitive. To talk about competitiveness and a tax is, I guess, the NDP way. To talk about competitiveness about Ontario businesses, to talk about competitiveness for, for our businesses, our job creators, we are not going to have a tax. We are not going to have the largest carbon tax in the world, the highest carbon tax in the world. We are going to cut that tax. And in doing that, we are going to create jobs for Ontarians, and we are going to create a better environment, a more affordable environment for our province. Next question. The member for Orléans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you for being elected as Speaker of the 42nd Legislature. Minister of Transportation. Last week, the minister claimed that Doug Ford will be remembered as the premier who brought transit to Ontario. Apparently, the ministerial script has been delivered to the PC party. You know, as of last June, there were more transit projects underway in Ontario than ever before, including the Ottawa LRT Phase 1 that is scheduled to carry its first passengers in November. The previous government committed to funding the LRT Phase 2, and I know during the campaign, the then leader, now Premier, did commit to funding not only the LRT Phase 2, but other projects yes. all across our great Many. province. Can the minister clarify for this House's remarks from last week about funding of ongoing pro transit projects? Right. And can he tell me today, can he tell us today actually, if uh, phase two of the LRT will be part of the funding? Minister of Transportation. Well, I thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to the honourable member from Orleans for the question and congratulations on your re election. Yes, I did say that Doug Ford would be the premier that brought transit to Ontario. I didn't talk about the history, absolutely, but he will be remembered as the premier who expanded the transit system in Ontario beyond the work of anyone before him. Here, here. Here, here. Our, commit our commitment to expanding transit in the province of Ontario is ironclad. It's as ironclad as the steel rails that move trains across this country. Speaker, and I can say on the LRT, we are continuously in negotiations with the City of Ottawa and discussions with the City of Ottawa. Phase two is absolutely, absolutely a project that this province, Response. under Doug Ford, will be partnering with the City of Ottawa. There is no question, and I can expand on that in the supplementary. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Uh, thank 
Thank you, uh, Minister. And, uh, you know, there is another uh, Tory Premier who is remembered for transit and is not fond memory. Mm. Mike Harris cancelled the Eglinton subway. He just didn't cancel it, actually. He filled in the tunnels that had already been dug. Uncertainty hurts Ontario's economy and its business community. And the $4.2 billion in corporate assets that are in limbo because this government cancelled carbon par permits has caused enough uncertainty. They don't need more on the transit file. We know that this government has already cut funding for schools, businesses, homeowners, and hospitals. Our transit project next. And will the minister commit to this House today that this government will not cancel any plan or ongoing Question. transit project, that this government won't fill in any more tunnels? Yeah. Response. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. You know, the, the members of the, the Liberal Party are going to have to get new scripts. That's the same script that they were using when they were in government. It, it didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. If they want to talk about previous governments, let's talk about the failures of the last government, the Liberal government that has now been reduced to seven seats across the province of Ontario, because the people said they want change, and Doug Ford and the PC party have brought that change. As speaker, let's be very, very clear. Our Premier has made it, make no mistake about it, transit under this government will get all the due attention it deserves, because we understand that if you can't move people Spons. and if you can't move goods, your economy will suffer. We've seen what neglect has done under the previous government. That won't happen under Doug Ford. And Thank you. Stop the clock. Members take their seats. Restart the clock. Next question, a member for Bruce Gray Owen Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. This will be a good Ontario one. continues to face a particularly challenging forest fire season. Conditions this year have resulted in significantly more fires in the province and a large area affected. I commend the minister and his ministry for their swift action in tomogamy and the efforts undertaken to help get the situation under control. But there is still more work to be done. Can the minister please inform the House of what steps his ministry has taken to ensure the ongoing safety of our communities? Thank you very much uh, uh, for the question, uh, member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. And I want to take this opportunity to congratulate you on being appointed the chief government whip of uh, a Doug Ford government. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reassure Ontarians that we're doing all we can to fight these fires attacking both on the air and on the ground. We have brought in over 450 skilled crews and aircraft from across Canada, the United States and Mexico to fight these fires alongside our fire rangers. Mr. Speaker, as wildland fires continue to burn across Ontario, I want to thank everyone who's been impacted for their cooperation and patience. I'd like to thank our brave fire rangers who are working tirelessly to fight these fires, protecting people and property. I'd also acknowledge the support of law enforcement, municipalities, indigenous Bonds. communities, and our emergency management staff during this time. Thank you very much. Back to the minister. Minister, I want to thank you for your service and your appointment. I know you're going to be a great member and lead on this file. Already is. I too would like to thank all the firefighters, fire rangers and other individuals working to get these fires under control. Their tireless efforts are beyond appreciated. Can the minister please provide this house with more details on what actions and additional support is taken to battle these fires in order to keep the residents of our northern communities safe? Minister. Thank you very much for the question. Mr. Speaker, with this government, public safety remains our priority at all times. Here, here. I know this is a challenging time for people who have been evacuated from their homes or impacted by smoke from these fires, and I'd like to thank them again for their cooperation and patience. Our government has continued to monitor these situations closely and will continue to provide information and updates as soon as they become available. Thank you. Next question, the member for Mistake Walk. James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier. The station has seen a flood of illicit drugs and alcohol in their communities. The Meshkegawa Council has also declared an emergency due to drugs. It takes Mishnabiaski Police Service a week to get a warrant 
for a justice of peace. It's so bad that the chief and other community leaders have had to seize the contraband themselves. Speaker, is it acceptable that access to the law is different depending where you live? And what does the Premier say to Ottawa Piscat and the Muskegon Tribal Council? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, Mr. Indigenous Mr. Speaker, Affairs. we appreciate the challenges and the opportunities that Indigenous communities in the remote and isolated parts of this great province uh, have. We're very sensitive to them. We also acknowledge that the uh, Trudeau government made it their priority to legalize marijuana without considering some of the consequences. And in the view of many Indigenous leaders, Mr. Speaker, was brought along too fast and too hard without appropriate consultation. Mr. Speaker, unlike the Liberal government, we're going to listen carefully to the concerns of Indigenous communities that they've raised regarding legalization of recreational mar marijuana, including the Mishkugiwak uh, Council, and I invite the member to put those uh, uh, to us in, in writing or through, uh, through the Chief, and I look forward to those conversations in the not-too-distant future. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Again, Mr. Speaker, the Anishinaabe police have been clear that they don't have the resource and their, and their property to patrol their vast territories, let alone tackle the crisis. The federal government have allowed, allocated $15 million to the First Nation police in the province. New Democrat committed $30 million a year. Speaker, how much is this government prepared to commit to First Nation police in the province? Minister. Ministry of Attorney General. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank you for your question. Um, our government will always work to ensure that our province's justice system is fair and equitable to everyone living in the province of Ontario. We are aware that the process may not always include all people. We will be looking forward to working, for, uh, working with people in your community and across communities around this province to make sure that we can identify initiatives uh, to help ensure that all Ontarians who, uh, who need to be properly represented are done so, are able to be represented. Um, and if the member opposite would like to work together on ways that we can do that, I look forward to the opportunity to sit down with him. Next question. The member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you on uh, being elected from this assembly as the Speaker of the Ontario Legislature. Congratulations! I look forward to working with you. My question is to the Minister of Transportation, Mr. Speaker. With an increasing number of vehicles on our roads and more goods being moved across our province, truck safety becomes ever more important. I know the OPP and other law enforcement agencies have been on our Ontario roads conducting safety blitzes to crack down on unsafe trucks and get the message out about safety. Can the Minister of Transportation tell this House what is being done to help improve truck safety on our highways? Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Chatham Kent Leamington for the question. And I want to congratulate him on his re-election, but also thank him for the ongoing commitment to truck safety that he has been a champion of ever since being, re -elected, uh, re being elected into this House. Speaker, I've had the opportunity in the last few weeks as the new Minister of Transportation, and I'm honoured to whole have that role, to speak with uh, members of the Ontario Trucking Association as well as the Private Motor Truck Council of Canada to talk about the commitments that we both share and the importance of truck safety. In this government, Safety of our people is our number one priority on our roads, uh, in our transit systems, and wherever they may be. We are going to ensure that, and many measures have already been done, we're going to ensure that we do everything we can to make our roads as safe as possible. They are among the safest in the province, Spons? and I can expand on that uh, in, the, in the supplementary as well. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, back to the uh, minister, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to thank the minister for outlining how important truck safety is to him and to this government. Now, the truck sector is important to our economy, and of course there are many good operators with good safety records, but it's an issue we must, we must always stay on top of. So can the minister outline what other steps he and his ministry are taking to ensure that Ontario continues to be a national leader in truck safety. Mr. 
thank you, Speaker. In addition to speaking to uh, members of the trucking associations, I also had the opportunity to have a lengthy conversation with uh, Vince Hawk, the Commissioner of the OPP, and we share a lot of uh, common ground with regards to what we should do and can do to make our roads as safe as possible. Recently, uh, just enacted on uh, July 1st, there's a zero tolerance policy for commercial truckers with regards to the use of alcohol or drugs. Uh, absolute zero tolerance. You cannot drink or use any drugs uh, when you're uh, any uh, drugs. Uh, you can be. You have your prescriptions, but you you can't have. Uh, can't be smoking marijuana and driving a truck in Ontario, uh, for sure. And those those kinds of issues, Speaker, are ones that we are absolutely committed to. Working with the OPP, working with the trucking associations, we have mandatory training now for someone to become a commercial Once. truck driver. So there are many, many things that have been done, and are we are going to do. But any time that anybody out there has a good suggestion for making our roads safer, we're ready to listen. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question, a member from North South Western. Congratulations, Mr. Speaker, congratulations for your election. My question is to the Premier. Community members of Rockcliffe neighborhood in my riding of York South Western are angry. They are angry because St. Helen Meat Packers Limited will be building a factory in their community. They are also hurt because their concerns have, have been ignored in the process. Instead of a long-awaited park being constructed in the community, the lot was sold uh, through a closed-door uh, cro close uh, uh, bidding process. Now, there will be no chance to modernize the area. That means no stores, no small businesses, or even a park. The Conservative government brides itself on being a transparent. So my question is, will this government stand beside the Rockcliffe community and ensure that this backdoor deal is stopped, or will it side with big businesses? Mr. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, to the honourable member. Uh, certainly, we'd be very interested in learning more details about this case. Um, I'm not sure whether any government ministry is actually involved at this time. Perhaps you could let us know during, uh, during the supplementary. Uh, we'll certainly work with you and uh, get back to you uh, and answer your questions fully to the satisfaction, hopefully, uh, of yourselves and your constituents. Uh, please send us more information. Supplementary. Yes. The, co the construction of St. Helen Meatpackers Limited factory will compromise the Rockcliffe community. To be clear, the meatpacking factory is expected to, to, build, to be built across the street from not one, but two schools, Rockcliffe Middle School and uh, Frank Oak Public School. It not only puts the health of young kids at risk, but, th but the land also has a history of flooding, and there are concerns that paving it over the increases that risk. Mr. Speaker, Rockcliffe resident deserves better. They should not have a factory, factory trucks driving past their homes and their schools on constant basis and risking con contamination of our community's air, water, and soil. So I ask again. Will this government review its environmental assessment and stop this backroom deal so the children and families of Rockcliffe can live and thrive in healthy community? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, and th uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Premier has indicated that he's very familiar with this issue, uh, so uh, he'll uh, bring us up to speed, and uh, we'll get back to the honourable member. We'll take the question on notice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Question the member for Durham. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, we know that Ontario has one of the largest debts of all subnational jurisdictions in the world. And, and our debt is almost equal to that of BC, Alberta, and Quebec combined. This is the true legacy of the mismanagement of the previous Liberal government. For people, for families in the riding of Durham, the state of the province's finances are deeply concerning. Would the President of the Treasury Board please inform us of the steps our government is taking 
to clean up the mess left by the previous Liberal government and restore respect for taxpayers in Durham and province-wide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the member from the Great Riding of Durham for that question. Mr. Speaker, this government is motivated by a deep desire to set our province and our economy on a more efficient and sustainable path. That is why we have embarked on a line-by-line -line audit of the province's books. In the 15 years that the previous Liberal government was in power, the average per capita debt increased by, and you won't believe this, $10,614. What kind of legacy is that for future generations? Mr. Speaker, the, the people of Ontario deserve answers. A comprehensive line-by-line -line audit of government spending will fulfil that commitment. The era of obfuscation is over. The era of accountability is back. My colleagues, promise made, promise, promise kept. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and please extend my thanks to the minister for his response. We know that immediate action must be taken to open up the books in this province. Under the previous government, our debt ballooned to $311 billion, and our credit rating was downgraded multiple times. Families in Durham are working hard and paying more than ever. They tell me that they want to change from the previous government, who wasted hard-earned money and spent our tax dollars on schemes that benefited political elites. Would the President of the Treasury Board please give us more details on how the line-by-line -line audit will bring this change? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government is taking immediate steps to restore public trust, and that is why the line-by-line -line review is first and foremost an efficiency exercise. We're looking at all ways we're spending money. The results of the line-by-line -line review will be used to develop a responsible plan to achieve efficiencies and deliver results for taxpayers. The entire point of this exercise is to ensure the sustainability of government services. The legacy on that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, is one of indebtedness for the next generation. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, our desire is to leave a legacy of hope and prosperity for the future of Ontario. Please take your seats. Please start the clock. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay Atacoke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Since April, 65 workers at the Port Arthur Health Centre, all of them women, have been on strike. They need a fair wage and health benefits so they can continue to provide great health care to the people of Thunder Bay. But the employer has refused to sit down. They've refused three requests for mediation from the Ontario Labour Relations Board and have refused to give these women a fair offer. And every day that the employer refuses to bargain, the people of Thunder Bay who rely on this clinic are struggling to get appointments, are struggling to get their medical information. They are forced into overcrowded clinics. They are forced to go to the overcrowded emergency rooms at our already beleaguered hospital and use the ambulatory care at our hospital as well. What will the Premier do to make sure that these health care workers get the respect they deserve and the people of Thunder Bay get the health care they need? In here. Mr. Labor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. I congratulate her on her election to the legislature. Um, we are certainly aware of the situation, uh, and we're monitoring it at the Ministry of Labor. Um, you know, this situation, both sides are encouraged to work together to resolve the differences at the bargaining table. The Ministry of Labour uh, mediators are available uh, to assist the 
parties in the process. And I, along, uh, agree with the member. We hope that there is a resolution coming soon uh, for the many reasons that sh she has mentioned. So we look uh, forward to that resolution, hopefully coming soon between the two parties, um, Ms., uh, to the member, and we will continue to monitor it. Supplementary. There are women at the Port Arthur Health Clinic who have worked there for 30 years. They have devoted their working lives to providing care to the families of Thunder Bay. I have received calls and emails with supporting those workers, and people are shocked to learn that they are making $14.71 uh, $14 an hour. Many of these women have been working casual for years, even though they work full-time hours and they are supported by public health care dollars. And even though they work at a medical clinic, the employer has refused to pay, pay them basic health benefits or WSIB. The employer has refused to come to the table. They have refused the help of the uh, Ministry of Labour. I asked the Premier again, what will the government do Question. to help these frontline workers and ensure that Thunder Bay can rely on the quality health care it needs. Thank you. Minister to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank Minister you very much for the question. Uh, I do appreci appreciate this is a serious situation. We want to make sure that everyone in Ontario has access to the health care services that they need. Having said that, as the member knows, the ministry is not a party to these negotiations, but we do encourage that both sides to get together to try and resolve this in the interests of the people of Thunder Bay area to make sure they receive the care services that they need. I know that everyone is concentrating on the best interests of the people in the community, and we look forward, hopefully, to a quick resolution. Next question, member for Cambridge. May I offer you my congratulations to your election to the chair. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mental health is an issue that affects many of those within this province, including many of the province's first responders. I was proud to see that our government, for the people, has taken the initiative to put forward the necessary funding for improving access to mental health supports throughout the province. With our government's commitment, we will be able to help those affected by mental health, including many of our first responders. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services please update the members of this legislature on what the ministry uh, will do to offer more support for our province's first responders? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd uh, first like to thank the member from Cambridge for her question in the legislature here today and to congratulate her on her election as the MPP for Cambridge. I know the member is an excellent representative for her constituents, and I wish her continued success here in the legislature. Addressing better access to mental health supports is an important issue that I have advocated for more than 15 years before serving as minister. We know our frontline officers deserve more, and our government will remain committed to providing the men and women of our police services with the resources and tools they require to keep communities throughout the province safe. One of the issues discussed recently in a meeting between the Premier, Minister Bill Blair, Mayor Tory, and Chief Saunders was mental health and the need for supports. It's why our government is investing $1.9 billion matched by the federal government into mental health care. We are committed to helping our frontline officers, and we will remain committed to helping them. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you for your kind remarks. I am proud of the trust that the people of Cambridge have placed in me. Thank you very much for your update on the mental health supports for our first responders. It is great to see the government for the people respecting our first responders and acknowledging the incredible job they perform day in and day out to ensure that Ontario's many communities are safe. Over the past 15 years, we witnessed the previous government fail to address the mental health of our first responders. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services please explain what tools and resources will be required to keep our frontline officers safe? Response. Thank you uh, once again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for uh, the supplemental question. 
Our party has not only committed to providing our frontline officers with the tools and resources they require, but will also continue to remain true to our commitment of improving access to mental health supports throughout this province. Mental health is an issue that affects many Ontarians, and this government acknowledges that something must be done and done soon. Our government has been clear on this issue and will continue to support the many men and women who performed their duties to keep our streets safe. We will review the pilot projects across the province and see which are working. Through our mental health commitment for our frontline officers, we'll make sure that they get the help they need and are able to provide the services we need them to provide. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Question, member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Middlesex London Health Unit has requested a six-month extension for London's temporary overdose prevention site, or TOPS, to keep the site operating until the permanent supervised consumption facility is in place. The temporary site was approved in February for a six-month period and has already made a huge impact in reducing the number of overdose deaths in London. Not only has the site saved lives by reversing overdoses, it has also referred almost 100 clients to other services, such as addictions treatment, mental health counselling and supportive housing. Speaker, will the Premier approve the extension of the temporary site and allow TOPS to continue providing life-saving care to some of London's most vulnerable and marginalised populations? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. We are committed to fighting the ongoing opioid and other drug crisis and get people struggling with the addiction the help that they need. We are currently reviewing the latest data, evidence, and current supervised consumption sites and overdose prevention site models. Premier Ford was clear during the election that he will listen to the experts and committed $1.9 billion to mental health and addictions programs, services and housing as to match the $1.9 billion committed by the federal government. And we are doing that right now. We are listening. We are listening to the evidence. We want to make sure that we get this right. We are listening to the evidence and the decision will be made in the near future. Thank you, Speaker. I think Premier Ford was clear during the election that he was dead against overdose prevention sites, even as the number of opioid-related deaths in Ontario continues to rise. Last year, across the country, 4,000 people died because of opioid poisoning, compared to 3,000 the year before. In my community of London, we have the third highest rate of hospitalizations due to opioid poisoning in Canada, the second highest in Ontario. Not only will keeping the temporary site open save lives, it will also help reduce some of the pressure on our hospital emergency room. Speaker, will the Premier make a decision based on solid research and evidence of harm reduction, or will he ignore the recommendations of public health experts and reject the request to keep the site open? I, I would like to clarify uh, Premier Ford's position on this issue and the position of our party. Subsequent to the announcement that you referenced in your question, Premier Ford did say that he wants to listen to the evidence, learn about the evidence, right. and make a decision right. based on the evidence. And right. that is what we're doing right now as part of our overall mental right. health Thank and you. addictions process in developing a comprehensive strategy. We are taking a look at the supervised injection sites and overdose prevention site models. Models. We want to make sure that we get it right. This is a big decision to make to continue and to open more if we need to have more. We are listening to the experts. We're listening to the Canadian Mental Health Association, Children's Mental Health Ontario, Addictions in Mental Health Ontario, to finally develop a comprehensive strategy for mental health and addiction in this province, including the supervised Spons. injection sites and overdose prevention site models. Members will please take your seats. Next questions. Restart the clock. Member for King Vaughan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this question is for the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, after 15 long years of economic stagnation, the people of this province, in their judgment, chose change. 
Mr. Speaker, they chose change for our working families. They chose change for our industry and small business. And Mr. Speaker, they chose change for the people here, here. of this province. While I know that change irks the members of the third party, they should come to appreciate the humility of being given seven seats in this legislature. Here, here, here. Mr. Here. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, after, after a decade of economic darkness in this province, the people want government to restore public trust. Minister, could you explain why it is so important we end the party with the taxpayer and get this inquiry of commission done? Mr. Finance. Well, thank you very much uh, to the member for the question. Uh, this uh, Commission of Financial Inquiry is all about restoring trust here, here, with here. the people of Ontario. These are very, very important steps that Premier Ford is taking to clean up Ontario's finances. Speaker, I want to refer to some specific language from both the Financial Accountability Officer and the Auditor General in both our public accounts and the FAO reports. He's referring to the former Liberal government's books. They are called unreliable. The word distort is there. Conceal. Deceptive, obstructive, unlikely assumptions, significantly understated, Spons. inappropriate. Wow. Wow. Speaker, they ended wow. with the accounting is bogus. That is why we're doing a commission of finance. Thank you. Members will take your seats. Take your seats. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Finance for explaining why we need to move forward with this level of accountability. Mr. Speaker, the province needs trust in government. After 15 years of lying and duplicity by the former Liberal government, the Absolutely out of order. I would ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. After 15 years, Mr. Speaker, of duplicity by the former government, it is so clear that we need the. There is, you, you can't uh, utter unparliamentary comments. The member will withdraw again. Withdraw, Mr. Speaker. I, the Mr. Speaker, we know they've cooked the books. Every per, every parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's enough. We have a deferred vote on government notice of motion number two relating to the allocation of time on Bill 2, an act respecting Hydro One Limited, the termination of the White Pines Wind Project, and the labour disputes between York University and the Canadian Union of Public Employees, Local 3903. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
Will the members please take their seats? On July 24, 2018, Mr. Smith Bay of Quinte moved the Government Notice of Motion No. 2 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 2, an act respecting Hydro One Limited, the termination of the White Pines Wind Project and the labour disputes between York University and the Canadian Union of Public Employees, Local 3903. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognised by the clerk. Mr. Smith, Mayor Quincy. Mr. Smith, Mayor Quincy. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bethan Fowler. Mr. Bethan Fowler. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Letcher. Mr. Letcher. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Key. Mr. Key. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Mr. Pa Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Downey. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Kanjan. Ms. Kanjan. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Ms. Y. Mrs. Stangri. Mrs. Stangri. Mr. Smart. Mr. Smart. Mr. Rasheed. Mr. Rasheed. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Kawartha. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Boma. Mr. Boma. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tani Castle. Mr. Tani Castle. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. We just keep going. Keep going. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. We should be song. We should be song. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Singh Brenton Center. Ms. Singh Brenton Center. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Mr. Mamako. Mr. Mamako. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mrs. Andrews. Ms. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Carpo. Uh, Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. The ayes are 68, the nays are 41. The ayes being 68 and the nays being 41, I declare the motion carried. <laughs> there being no further business this morning, this House is in recess until this afternoon at 3 p.m.